Hi, and welcome to Econ 480. These videos were recorded while I taught the class over Zoom, but they were edited so that the student faces, their questions, and my answers to those questions do not appear. As a result, these videos are going to be shorter than a normal lecture and then may have natural transitions. But I hope you enjoy them anyway. Bye now. All right, so let's get started then. This is lecture one. We're going to start talking about um, linear regression. So we're going to use the following notation for essentially the entire first uh, half of this class. We're going to let y, x, and u be a random vector where y and u are going to be scalar random variables that are going to take values in the real for now. And then x is just going to be a vector that is going to take values in r, k plus 1. So the dimension of x is going to be k plus 1. We're going to assume that the first component of this vector x is a constant equal to 1. So we can write x as x0, x1, dot, dot, xk, <coughs> where x0 is just equal to 1. In other words, um, we have k variables and a constant term. Uh, we're going to let beta be also a vector of dimension k plus 1, and then it's going to be sorted as beta 0, beta 1, dot, dot, beta k, the same way following the notation of x. And it's just going to be such that y is equal to x prime beta plus u. In this notation, typically we say beta is an intercept or constant term, and the other beta j's are slow parameters, okay? And what we're going to talk about today is the fact that there are several ways to interpret beta, okay, depending on what type of assumptions we make about x, y, and u. And we're going to discuss these three different ways. Mainly, the three ways are going to be the linear conditional expectation interpretation, the best linear approximation interpretation, and the causal interpretation. And we're going to go one by one. Once we do this, we're going to then describe what's a representation for this parameter beta. And then we're going to discuss how to estimate beta if we observe a sample of data coming from this uh, random variable. So the first interpretation is called the linear conditional expectation. And we're going to suppose that the expected value of y given x is given by x prime beta. And we're going to define u as just the difference between y and its conditional expectation. This, um, as I wrote here, has several uh, implications. The first one is that by construction, the expected value of u um, given x is equal to zero. Okay, just look at the definition of u. And if you take conditional expectation of u given x, you get the expected value of y given x minus the expected value of y given x, which is zero. So this means, in turn, that the expected value of u is just going to be zero, because by the law of iterative expectation, you can write this like this, and that's zero. And this also implies that the expected value of x u is going to be zero, because again, by the law of iterative expectations, we have that this is zero. So when we have a model where you say that x prime beta is the conditional expectation of y given x, then uh, by construction, you get that this u, which is the difference, okay, is zero mean and is uncorrelated with x, not only uncorrelated, it has a zero conditional expectation by construction. So what is beta in this particular case? Well, you should say beta, as I wrote here, is a convenient way of summarizing a feature of the joint distribution of y and x. Um, and that's it. That's essentially all you can say. However, the main question that students and people typically ask, or sometimes even use, is um, whether we can interpret beta or one of these low parameters, say beta j, as the Sitter's Paribus of a, um, effect of a one unit change of xj on y. That is, 
is a derivative effect. You want to interpret beta as if I move xj by one unit, then y is just going to change by beta j units. And the question is whether you can interpret beta like this when this is um, the starting uh, modeling assumption for beta. And the answer is that you cannot. That when you have a linear conditional expectation model, and that's all you have, that's all you know, you're just viewing beta as a conditional expectation of y given x, then you cannot interpret beta costly unless you add more information. The reason is, as you can imagine, you can grab any two random variables, and by construction, you know, they, you know, assuming moments exist, which I assume here that the expected value of y is finite, but let's assume that first moments exist, then you can always define conditional expectations of random variables. And then, as I wrote, you know, in the notes, which is an example that, you know, um, so simple that everybody understands, you can say x is an indicator of whether people are carrying an umbrella and y is an indicator of rain, uh, that is completely well-defined. However, typically you will not believe that if you just tomorrow decide to go outside with an umbrella, you're gonna cause rain, okay? But the conditional expectations are well-defined. And if you compute the conditional expectations, you will see things like, for example, chances of rain are higher when you see umbrellas. That would be a prediction problem, but it's not a causal problem. And during the first part of this class, we're gonna try to learn and understand this distinction. I'm pretty sure that if I just go one by one through each of you and ask you a quiz about linear regression and least squares, most of you, of course, have been exposed to this. They know what least squares is. They know the least squares estimator. You even know properties. But if I start asking other type of questions that are more conceptual about when you can admit, give beta a causal interpretation, why you need to give beta a causal interpretation, and uh, the uh, differences between looking at something costly versus a problem, uh, most often the clarity uh, is way lower. So that's why I want to spend the first few lectures of this class um, clarifying these distinctions. Okay? Any questions about the linear condition expectation? Again, this is not an important question by any means. It's just things that I need to get a sense of following. Second interpretation, best linear approximation. So in general, I would say the conditional expectation of two random variables are probably not linear, okay? The word is not linear, we know that. And you know, the question is then, if you're serious about that, if you're serious about understanding things are not linear, then what are you doing? Well, we're gonna suppose that we have second moments now. Suppose that the expected value of y squared is finite, the expected value of x x prime is finite, or in other words, the second moments of all the x's are finite. And then once we have second moments, okay, we may consider what is this, uh, what I wrote here, um, the best linear approximation, okay, which is the best function of the form x prime beta, okay, to the conditional expectation. So here we're not saying that the conditional expectation is linear. That's what we said in the first interpretation. Here we're saying, well, what if I know that the conditional expectation may not be linear, okay, but what I want to find is what is the best linear approximation to that function. And so at the end of the day, what we're doing is considering an optimization problem that looks like this. Just minimize some loss, in this case, expected squared loss of the function that you want to approximate, the conditional expectation, and the linear function, okay? And if we denote this solution by beta, we're gonna have the same case that we said before, you're gonna be able to write y is equal to x prime beta plus u, as we're gonna see in a minute. It's gonna be, take us back to the first equation that I wrote. So what is beta here? Well, beta is just gonna be what I wrote here, a convenient way of summarizing, again, a feature of the joint distribution of y and x. It's not the same one in the first interpretation. Beta doesn't say anything about the conditional, it's not the conditional of y, um, uh, given x, but it's just the best linear approximation. Sometimes it's called a projection, okay? It's a projection of y onto the space of the x's. And the question again is, can we interpret beta causally? And then in this model, if you started off by this idea that you're just giving the best linear approximation to the conditional mean, well, no, beta here doesn't admit uh, causal interpretation.
And so the claim that I'm going to make that is sometimes used here is that beta not only is the best linear approximation to the conditional expectation of y given x, is um, the um, best linear predictor of y given x. I turn. <clears throat> so in other words, if you just compare here, here we're minimizing or choosing the best linear prediction to the conditional expectation, whereas here we're just looking for the best linear predictor of the value of y. These two problems are um, ex ante different, okay? One has a conditional expectation, the other one has the y, okay? But it turns out that these two are equivalent. Um, and let me clarify that. So um, let's start with the other one that we had. So expected value of expected value of y x minus x prime b, where um, and then what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to add and subtract y. So all I did is add and subtract y inside. And I'm going to let this object over here, respective value of y given x minus y, I'm going to call this b. So I'm going to have respective value of uh, b squared minus 2b x uh, prime beta plus y minus x prime b squared. So I worked out the square and I used the notation where I replaced b. Okay. So now I'm going to pass the expectation. I'm going to have expected value of b squared minus 2 expected value of b. Sorry. It's y then plus two expected value b prime b plus expected value y minus x b where and notice that this expectation over here is zero because again by construction the expected value of b given x is zero given our definition of b over here by construction the expected value of b given x is zero and so as we saw before if the condition expectation is zero the expected value of b times x is zero as well so and this over here is a constant it doesn't depend on b that's what i mean right so at the end of the day this is equal to a constant plus effective value of y minus x prime b squared. So in other words, solving, minimizing, finding beta that minimizes this objective function, equivalent to finding beta that minimizes this objective function. And what we get at the end of the day is that this um, way of looking at beta as a projection coefficient which is our second interpretation, actually has two alternative interpretations. One is the beta that gives us the best linear approximation to the conditional mean, and the other one is the beta that gives the best predictor or best linear predictor to uh, y given x, okay? Both are absolutely equivalent. And so these are two interpretations that fall into the same family, okay? So... One thing to notice is that in particular, if you just focus on <clears throat> the second one over here, um, this one, that this function is convex as a function of B. So we can take a derivative with respect to B of this object. And this is just going to be negative 2, effective value of x, y x prime and then we can say that beta 
solves expected value of x, y, x prime beta equal to zero. So if we let u be defined as y minus x prime beta, then expected value of x u is equal to zero by construction. So in this second interpretation of beta, we have that by construction, x is going to be orthogonal to the error term that is going to capture the difference y and x beta. Okay? So this, in particular, is not an assumption. Okay? When you interpret beta as a projection coefficient, then assuming that the expected value of x u is zero is not an assumption. It's just a product of the optimization problem that you're solving. It's a product of how you are interpreting beta. So if somebody tells you, I'm going to project y on this axis, okay? There are no assumptions involved in there, aside from, you know, the existence of the second moments. Other than that, beta is always well-defined. A projection coefficient is always well-defined, you know, leaving aside it. So this is something that sometimes generates confusion because, you know, most students, when they come from taking other econometrics courses, first thing they learn is that, well, we're assuming that X is orthogonal to the error term. And, you know, that depends on what's the interpretation that you're giving to the model. And that's what we're trying to explain. If you, what you're doing is just interpreting beta as a projection coefficient, well, this then is not an assumption, just about product of your interpretation and what you're doing. In other settings, like in the next one we're going to see next, this is going to be a fundamental assumption. Um, notice again that if you just say the conditional expectation of y given x, as we did in the first interpretation, that would be your assumption that the conditional expectation of y given x is linear, okay? But then this feature over here is a byproduct of that. So it matters what you assume. It matters how you want to interpret beta to determine what are assumptions and what are not assumptions. Questions? All right. Now we get to the causal model. Suppose now that we have that y is equal to g x u, okay? Uh, where x are some, I would call it observed determinants, okay, of y, and u are unobserved determinants, meaning like you have some variable that you care about y. Okay, and then you have things that you observe, x's, and you have things that you don't observe, u. Um, so the idea here is that from the get-go, you have some form of like a model that tells you how y is related to the x's, which are the things that you observe, and the u's, which are the things that you don't observe, okay? And so that's what I wrote here. This is a relationship. <clears throat> is uh, uh, how a model for how, how y is determined uh, as a function of the other things. And this may come from physics, economics, or any other science that tells you how things are determined. Think about consumer theory in economics. You just solve, you know, demand. Uh, um, consumers maximize uh, utility, have a demand function, and the demand depends on prices and income. And not only that, you even have some signs that you know that um, uh, are there, you may even, depending on the model that you're using, you can assume, you may know that the demand is cave in prices or, or something else. You have some shape restrictions. You have a model, okay? And the model tells you, you know, how a given variable moves as you move the other ones, okay? So the effect of xj on y holding the other uh, variables constant and the u constant, okay, is determined by this function g that I have over here, okay? And in particular, if this g is differentiable, then that's, of course, given by the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to xj of this function g of x and u. Great. <clears throat> and if you now assume, okay, that this function g is linear, okay, so now g is just x prime beta plus u, then the effect of 
y of xj on y keeping all the other stuff constant is simply beta j okay now notice that as opposed to the other cases here um we don't know anything about the specti value of u given x given xj specti value of u j you may of course assume that the specti value of u is zero okay so that is not an assumption because you can absorb any difference uh by the beta naught okay so suppose that that expectation was not zero you can always renormalize by subtracting the expectation and adding the expectation to the constant term because we have a constant term okay so then in general you can always assume that the specti value of all the things that you don't observe is zero okay but this is a normalization it's not an assumption However, when you go to say statements about the things that you don't observe with respect to the things that you do observe, okay? If you think about correlation, you're saying the things that I do not observe are uncorrelated with the things that I do observe. Well, that becomes an assumption. And whether this is a, a really strong assumption or a weak assumption depends, of course, on the setting. But when you are starting with this as a model of causality where you want to interpret beta as a causal thing you have to think about this partition as the things that you observe the things that you don't observe and now any statement about um covariances between those two are a statement about things that you observe and things that you don't observe you here is not defined as a byproduct of the interpretation of beta as it happened in the first two interpretations here you is an object by itself it has uh, all these elements that determine why that um, you don't get to observe. Now, when you get to this point, you know, and if you assume, look, this is how Y is generated, I'm gonna interpret beta costly, then it's fine. Um, and then you can tell me like, look, I'm gonna just gonna make the assumption that the things that I uh, don't observe are uncorrelated with the things that I observe. Well, fine, then we have a linear regression you have the condition that you will need to identify beta, and then you have a causal interpretation. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's exactly the same thing as we're going to see in a minute. It's just what you're assuming in the background to be able to say with a straight face that your model emits a causal interpretation. So what I want to do now is to go through a very simple setting to clarify how much you're really asking from a model to really give beta this causal interpretation. And probably the easiest way to do that is to use the so-called potential outcomes, which I'm assuming you're familiar with, but I'm going to go over just in case you haven't seen this uh, before. The potential outcomes, as I wrote here, are an easy way to think about causal relationships. And <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is to think about an illustration, okay? Very simple case where we have a randomized control experiment where individuals are randomly assigned to treatment. Here I wrote a drug. Um, that is intended to improve their health status, okay? Probably a more uh, contemporaneous uh, change here could be a COVID vaccine or something like that, right? But uh, that's what I want to think about, to think about binary, binary, something very simple. So why is just going to be the health status, okay? Let's say, you know, whether um, you're alive or not. And then X is whether you get the vaccine or not, or the drug or not. And the causal relationship between X and Y can be described, this is just notation, okay? This is not, it's just a way of thinking. Uh, can we be described uh, using this so-called potential outcomes where the notation is gonna be Y0 and Y1. Y0 is gonna be the potential outcome in the absence of the treatment. Y1 is gonna be the potential outcome in the presence of the treatment. And so the idea is that for each individual, think about this situation in which you have two random variables, okay? where y0 is the value of the outcome that would have been observed if possibly counter to fact, x were set to zero, and y1 is the value of the outcome that would have been observed if, again, possibly counter to fact, x were one. So think about yourself, okay? And now you want to know what are the odds that you um, get COVID, okay? and that will be your y, and then, you know, x is whether you get a vaccine or not. and so. For each of you, this is a way of thinking what would your life be from here on if you get vaccinated and if you're not vaccinated, okay? And then 
these are kind of factuals because of course in reality as we're going to see next you always observe only one of these for each individual because the individual either got vaccinated or did not get vaccinated but you want to think about the possibility that uh, this individual uh, was not vaccinated so the difference between y1 and y0 is what we typically call the treatment effect, okay? And this is a causal effect of, say, the vaccine or the drug, is how much you change your outcome by having or not having this vaccine. And if you take an expectation of this, this is typically called the average treatment effect because it's a random variable, and this is the expected value of a random variable. This is a summary measure of these treatment effects, and in particular, of course, is the average or the expectation. It's called the ATE. So notice that now if we use this notation, we can write the outcome as follow y, which is the, the, the variable that we get to observe, okay? It's just gonna be y1 if you get vaccinated, which is x is binary, so x is one, and it's gonna be y0 if you do not get vaccinated, so one minus x. And so I can rearrange this. I can write this as y0 plus y1 minus y0 x. And let me do um, one additional thing. I'm going to write this um, expected value of y0. I'm going to add and subtract the expected value of y0. So now if you let me call this object over here beta zero, if you let me call this object over here beta one, and if you let me call this object over here u, okay? This model, since we have a, a randomized control experiment, we know that u is independent of x by construction because vaccines are randomly assigned in our setting. And then you can say, well, we got a linear model that is causal, okay, just by thinking about the problem using these potential outcomes and using the fact that we're in a very simple setting where we have a binary um, treatment. But this is not true. Um, I'm going to say here, almost. A linear model. And why is not this a linear model like the one we started with early on? Beta one here is random. Not a constant coefficient, okay? It's just the difference of two random variables. So beta one in this way of writing the model is random. So this doesn't fit into what we started with at the beginning of the lecture. So what we need to assume is that beta is constant. So we will need to assume that y1 minus y0 is constant. What does it mean? It means that every single individual reacts to the vaccine in exactly the same way. Okay, and so everybody is affected by the vaccine in the same way. And if you accept this assumption, then we go back and then we say, okay, we have a linear regression model where you can run a regression of y on x, and then beta can be interpreted as as a marginal effect of the drug. Okay, and it's going to be causal. But what we needed to get there was one a randomized control experiment where the x's were randomly assigned, and an assumption that says that all the individuals react to the treatment in exactly the same way. You put those two things together, and then you have a linear regression model that has a causal interpretation. Well, that is um, kind of like weird, right? So notice here that 
the first part of this lie summarizes what I said before. We have this model. It's not quite a linear model because this coefficient beta one is random. For beta one to be constant, we need to assume that the treatment effect is constant, the same for everybody across individual. And if we assume all these assumptions, we have a linear constant effect causal model with u independent of x, and then these assumptions um, that we need. Okay. And if we don't assume the constant treatment effect, okay, if we still keep the random experiment assumption, okay, but we're not willing to assume uh, this, which is crazy, okay, then you can show, and this is in the problem set, that a regression of y on x identifies the average treatment effect. So beta, if we just run a regression of y on x in this setting, beta is going to recover the expected value of y given x. So notice that this is often called a causal parameter, given that it is an average of causal effects. It is a causal parameter. It's not exactly the, the, you know, the derivative of how somebody will behave, because here the derivative is heterogeneous. People behave in different ways. But beta gives you something that admits uh, a type of causal interpretation, because it's an average uh, treatment effect. And this is what you obtain now if you're not willing to assume that this effect is homogeneous, okay? But you still have the setting where X is exogenous and so on. Questions? No worries. All right, so linear regression when expected value of X U is zero, okay? So it doesn't matter whether you're in interpretation one, interpretation two, interpretation three, okay? That's how you interpret what you say about the number that you're gonna obtain at the end of the day. All these three interpretations at the end of the day are going to require some assumption to represent beta. In the first two, you get these two by construction, okay? In the third one, this has to be an assumption. So we're going to start here. Why are we going to start here? Because again, in the first two interpretations, this is not an assumption. This is just what you obtain. So it's natural to start here. So uh, we're going to have the same setting, setting as we had before. Y, X, U, uh, random vector, Y and X scalars, X dimension K plus 1, beta dimension K plus 1, U is equal to X plus beta uh, plus U. And we're going to have three assumptions. The first one is the expected value of X, U is 0. That's what we're saying here. The second one is that there are circle moments in the X's. Okay, expected value of X, X prime is finite. And the third one, which is new, is that there is no perfect collinearity in X, okay? And we're going to describe what this is in a second, but these are the three assumptions that we're going to need to characterize beta in the next slide. The justification of one, which is this one over here, varies depending on which of the three preceding interpretation we invoke. By that I mean, again, in the first two, there's not an assumption, just by construction. In the third one, it is an assumption, and it may be a strong assumption or weak assumption depending on the setting. Two is ensuring that this expectation exists. This expectation is going to pop up at some point, so we want to make sure that it exists. Um, and three, it's equivalent to the assumption that the matrix X, X prime, the same one that we're defining over here, is in fact invertible. Okay. And so since this matrix is positive semi definite, because it's a product of the same matrix, invertibility is equivalent to say that this matrix over here is positive definite. So when we say no perfect collinearity, it's the same as we say this matrix over here is invertible, or if we say that this matrix over here is positive definite, you know, as we move along the class, I want to use all these three interchangeable, interchangeably. Um, so, um, but for now, we're going to stick to the uh, no perfect collinearity. And so since we're going to use these three, I'm going to prove it, okay? The proof is just one line. So the definition is there is perfect collinearity or multicollinearity in X if there exists a non-zero C, a vector of dimension K plus one, such that the probability that C prime X being equal to zero is one. Uh, what this means is that we can express one component of the X as a linear combination of the other one, okay? This is exactly what C prime X equal to zero means. We can write exactly one column as a linear combination of the other columns. These are random variables, so this has to happen with probability one. And the lemma over here says, let x be such that 
this expectation exists, then expected value of x x prime is invertible if and only if there is no perfect collinearity in x. To see that, um, you know, take c in um, k plus one, and then know that c prime expected value of x x prime c is equal to, I'm just going to bring this c inside, c prime x, x prime. Now, since c and x have the same dimension, c prime x is scalar. So this expected value, c prime x square. And once you're here, the result is kind of immediate because if this is strictly positive for any C, which is the definition of positive definite, well, then this is positive for any C as well. Okay. And then if you want to think, you know, as a proof where you prove if and only if, you say, suppose that here uh, we have that X is um, is not perfectly uh, that there is perfect collinearity. So then c prime x by this definition over here is zero for some c. So the expected value of c prime x square is just zero, and that means that this is zero. That means that this cannot be positive definite. And then if you go the other way, suppose that this is not positive definite. Well, there is a c such that this entire product is zero which means that the expected value of c prime x square is zero, but this variable is positive. So the only way for this variable to have a zero uh, expectation is for this variable to be zero with probability one, which is the definition of perfect cone. So these two things are aligned. They mean the same thing. And that's the proof of our lemma. So now we're going to solve for beta. Again, remember that we're using this assumption, expected value of ux is equal to zero. And so this implies that if I now replace u by y minus x beta, okay, then we can just split this and we get this main equation over here. Okay. It says expected value of xy equals expected value of x, x prime times beta. And this is, you know, our third assumption, the fact that says that there's no perfect collinearity. Uh, um, uh, we we have imposed means that this matrix is invertible, and so now we can find a solution for beta. So beta is equal to the expected value of x x prime inverse expected value of x y. It happens to be that this matrix is not invertible. Okay, then that only means that there are going to be more than one solution to the system of equations. Okay, and all solutions are going to have this property that the probability of x beta and x beta prime, if both beta and beta prime are a solution to this equation at the top, this, this are going to be one. Um, if whether this is important or not, again, it depends on the interpretation. Because if your goal, for example, is to provide the best linear prediction to something, and there happen to be two solutions that give the best linear prediction, um, you don't care. They give the same quality of prediction by this statement over here. However, if you care more about a causal effect and then how x moves and y moves, then this is really important because then getting beta and beta tilde, they can give two very quite drastic uh, interpretations or effects, okay, on how F x affects y. So in that case, having more than one solution may be important, okay? This is just to say the assumption of invertibility depends on the context, but we're going to assume it moving forward. So in our setting, beta is going to have a unique solution, and the unique solution is going to be given by this equation here um, in the um, second display. So how are we going to estimate this? Well, to estimate, we need a sample. So we're going to assume that x, um, y, and u are as before, and we're going to denote by p the marginal distribution of x and y, okay? The distribution of things that do not include u. Of course, you know, this is k plus two dimensional. So, um, so when I say here, marginal distribution is with respect to x, y, and u. This is a joint distribution of y and x. 
And we're going to assume that we have a random sample as an IID, independent, identically distributed sequence of random variables with distribution P. We're going to denote our sample as this, y1, x1, dot, 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 yn, xn. And so what is the natural estimator of the beta that we just described before? Well, the beta had the spectral value of this times the spectral value of that. And, you know, the natural estimators typically what they do is just going to replace any expectation, okay, with things that look like 1 over n, um, 1 over n of the same objects, okay? That's sometimes called the analogy principle. And the idea is replace expectations with sample averages, and that will give you an estimator with some basic properties. So most often things like consistency. So if we replace these expectations over here with sample averages, we get this estimator of beta that we're going to denote by beta hat n, just 1 over n, the sum from 1 to n of xi, xi prime inverse, times 1 over n, the sum from 1 to n, xi, yi. And this estimator is called the ordinary least squares or just least squares estimator of beta. And it has this name because it's not difficult to show that this estimator actually solves this optimization problem at the bottom, okay? Which in, in a way is the sample analog of the second version of interpretation number two. And we talk about the projection interpretation. Well, here, you see that the least squares uh, estimator is actually minimizing the difference of the uh, the square difference of y and x prime beta. So I wrote beta hat solves this minimization problem. Again, this function over here um, is again convex in B, so we can take a derivative with respect to B of this object is 1 over n, um, 1 to n of yi as x prime b square. And this is negative 2 times 1 over n um, from 1 to n xi yi minus x prime b. Um, beta hat n. That's first order condition to zero. So what we have is a one over n sum um, one to n xi yi plus x prime beta hat n is equal to zero. So now, if we let the no say u hat the so called residual of this regression, so it will be y plus x prime beta hat n, then the first order condition can be written like this. Okay? So here, the residual is orthogonal x by construction. This should not be surprising, I guess, because in the second interpretation that we saw before, when we were solving this optimization problem at the population level with the expectations, we got that the u, in that case, the error term, was orthogonal to x by construction. Spective value of x times u was zero. Well, here, we're working with the sample. We have analog, um, similar objects in the sample. And then we have the residual here, u hat. Well, u hat is orthogonal to x by construction in at least um, square regression. So then, OK, no problem. Uh, beta hat n here, um, if you solve and take it to the other side, or ah, um, let's call this start from start. We have that one over n 
sum one to n x i y i equals one over n sum over n i x i prime beta hat n. So if this matrix over here happens to be invertible, it may or may not be invertible, okay, but we know that the spectral value of that is invertible. So this guy is going to be invertible with probability approaching one. So that means if you have a large enough sample that will happen, then we can write this estimator exactly as I wrote it before. And then we show that the least squares estimator is a sample analog of beta as before solves this optimization problem. Do you have any questions about this? Last slide. A question slide. Put this question slide to remind me myself to ask you questions. Okay. Otherwise, as I said, I just go too fast. And I see the question slide and it reminds me I should ask you a question. Sometimes I remember that before I see this. Um, so, any questions that are not about the last slide but are about anything else? Or I'll be able to help, but you can still answer the question. Um, matrix notation. So I typically I avoid trying uh, using matrix notation, uh, mostly because in normal times I write on the board everything, and I'm very bad at writing these bold letters. So I try to avoid them. Okay. So, uh, but the matrix notation sometimes is useful for certain things. We're going to use, I want to try to minimize it as much as possible. So I'm going to use it in selective places where using it simplifies the derivations a lot. So I want you to be familiar with it. Okay. So in a way, we're going to have this ball Y is the vector of dimension N of all the Y's. Ball X is just going to be a matrix of dimension N times K plus one of all the X's. Y hat is just going to be the fitted values, x times beta hat n. U is the error term, is a vector of dimension n. U hat is a residual, which is a vector of dimension n. It can be written as y minus y hat, or y hat are the fitted values, so you can write as y minus x beta hat n. And in this notation, the least squares estimator that we just uh, wrote, can be written as uh, x prime x inverse x prime y, okay? Which is um, funny enough, I think probably the only thing that people that um, took econometrics courses and did something unrelated later on in life remember, probably. Uh, that has been my experience. People remember x prime x inverse x prime y. Uh, we're not going to be using this um, notation much, but uh, and then you can show that this is solves exactly the same problem that uh, we solved before, which is this uh, minimum of squares, okay? And then, you know, there are um, graphical interpretations, uh, geometric interpretation you give to least squares. If you write things like this, um, I don't care about that, but there you can take a look at it. The thing that I want to use, and the reason why I introduced this notation is to define two projection matrices. These projection matrices are really useful when you want to work out with sub vectors of axes and you want to get rid of objects that are going to appear later, like you know, you know fixed effects or things like that. Um, so it is a following: you can write x uh, beta hat as uh, here's x and here's beta hat, and so um, when you write it like this, you can see that at the end of the day. Your prediction, okay, this is your prediction of y given your axis, is just a linear transformation of the axis. It's all functions of axis, okay, 
all functions of axis times the y. So then you define this matrix P, which is all this part over here, which is a projection matrix. And the reason it's a projection matrix is because you just apply this matrix to y, and what you get in return is just the projection of y given the axis is x times beta hat. So this is known, as I wrote here, as a projection matrix. And this projection matrix has properties, okay? And in particular, it's idempotent. So P squared is equal to P. And so this is something that um, we're going to use, okay? And it has these other properties that um, what it means here, as I wrote, reflects the fact that projecting something that already lies in the column space of the axis onto the column space of the axis does nothing. Okay, just obtain the same thing. Um, this matrix P is also symmetric, which is something that may use may be used later. And then the other thing that we're going to define is this matrix M. Okay, M is going to be the difference between the identity matrix and this projection P, and it's also a projection matrix. Both are called projection matrices. Okay, although this last one sometimes is called a residual maker matrix, but what it does is this just essentially gives you um, the residuals, okay? Because if you apply M to Y, you have P times Y, which is X prime beta, and then I times Y, which is Y. So you get U hat, okay? And the nice feature about this matrix M is that M times X is zero. So M is orthogonal to X, okay? So later on in the class, we're gonna use these two projection matrices, P and the M. Not a lot. I'm going to reduce its use as much as possible, but I'm going to use it in a couple of lectures. Okay? And that's it for today. So um, I don't think I have anything else to cover. Uh, next class, we're going to move to talk about subvectors. You know, if you have a lot of Xs, but you care about only one of those components, how can you model that easily? And then we're going to talk about properties of these least squares estimator. We're going to talk about finite sample properties and what are the assumptions that you need for those finite sample properties. And we're going to talk about asymptotic uh, properties. So, um, any other questions? Yeah.